Okay, hello everybody and thanks for coming to this uh, webinar um, as part of our national three week uh, activities. Uh, we started this kind of thing really last year because COVID was wiping out all our uh, events where people had to gather physically and we had some very interesting talks so we decided to, to continue it and uh, Amy Nilauna, whom you probably know, is, um, according to Virgin Media, is an environmental whiz. And she's also president of the Tree Council of Ireland. And she's going to give a talk about mythology and various legends and so on associated with trees in Ireland. So, Aina, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Brendan. That's great. So good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all again. I can't see anybody, but I'm sure I'm sure you're all seeing me, which is a great treat for you. And I'm going to talk to you today about the, the folklore and the mythology of trees. Now, this is probably, as my colleague Richard Collins would say, the antithesis of science. This is the other end of the spectrum entirely. It's how people regarded trees, what they thought about them. And it was how the people long ago, when trees were really important in Ireland, how they how they felt about it. So it's not scientific or gospel or anything like that. So if I say a curse will fall upon you if you look at a tree, that's what people thought. It won't actually. So anyway, without any further ado, I will go away and share my screen, hopefully. Now, I presume that's working because Siobhan would tell me if it wasn't. Is that working, Siobhan? I'm sure it is. Great. OK. Now, so... um. Trees and Irish folklore then. So well, what do we mean when we talk about trees and Irish folklore? And we're talking about how people regarded trees in Ireland ever since there were people here. Now, people weren't here from the very beginning. I mean, this is a picture taken, taken during the last ice age. We had great cameras in those days. Now, I'm always showing this slide. And in fact, it's not ice covered in Ireland. It's actually clouds. But it's the same general impression. You had the country covered in maybe one and a half kilometres of, of ice because it was, it was much colder times, and just the very tips of the mountains were sticking up. And then climate changed, it got warmer, due to sunspots, wasn't due to people at that stage, and the ice all melted. And then Ireland, because the sea was so much lower, was joined to Britain, was joined to mainland Europe, and we began to get covered in plants and animals and vegetation. So we began to get covered in different types of trees, and in fact, there were three types of forests that covered Ireland at that time. Up on top of the mountains, you had forests of um, Scots pine. Um, further down, you had forests of, of oak because though it was um, poorer soils, so we generally we had the oak forests. And then on the good on the good land, then we had we had deciduous woodland. But the good land was really really wanted afterwards for for um, farming and and the like. So getting a picture of a lovely ash woodland is not so easy. So here's one of a beech woodland. Now I do realize beech is not wasn't there at that time, Beach only came in with the Normans. But the idea of deciduous woodland on good land, deciduous woodland on poorer land like the oak woodlands and the, the, the Scots pine up on the high mountains. They were the three types of woodland that were there when the first people came then to Ireland to actually come. And so the first people came to Ireland, I suppose, maybe a thousand years after all this. So the country was covered in forests. The way they travelled were on boats. So they, they had up the rivers between that. It was, it was quite a different world to what it was now. And so the, the, the trees and the forests meant a huge deal to people coming this way. And they, they regarded trees as a bridge, as it were, between the earth and the heavens, a connection with the gods. You had the roots obviously in the, in, the, in the earth, in the soil. So they were down in the underworld. You had the trees, you had the actual leaves and the branches up in the sky, they were up in the heavens. And then the humans on, on actual ground, on terra firma, if you like, they were, they were looking up and looking down. So the trees were a link, as they thought, between, between the, the underworld and the skies. And obviously um, Christianity didn't happen until 2,000 years ago. We're talking about people that began to arrive in Ireland 8,000 years ago. So there was no Christianity. There was no, the religions that we had looked at other things for gods, looked at other things for un, unexplainable events. So trees and what they did and where they grew and how they operated were, were part really of a world that was controlled by gods that we don't, we don't have nowadays. And this is just in the picture, our tallest native ash. Now, ash, with ash, as I said, was one of the ones that were the canopy trees on the very good soil. This is 40 metres high and it's down in Marlfield in Clonmel in County Tipperary. 
Now, needless to say, at this time, the, the, plant, the trees that were there were native species. Now, what do we mean by native species? How long do you have to be here to be a native? A native species in this context doesn't mean how long you're here. This means how they arrived. So if you're a native tree, you were brought not by humans, you were brought by, by natural means. And many of the things that brought trees to Ireland were actually birds. Now, they didn't come with a flower pot and a tree under their oxter. They came with the seeds inside in their tummies because a lot of our native trees have, have berries on them and inside them the berries are stones. So the birds ate the berries and the stones were in their tummies and they flew a bit further north and they landed on another tree and they relieved themselves and the stone came out and the tree grew. So originally the very first ones like birch and willow, their seeds were blown by the wind because they were tiny little seeds. So there were trees for the birds coming that had eaten the berries of things like things like you, they'd eaten the berries of things like um, holly, gelder rose, black thorn, all of these white beam, all these, these ones that had berries in them. So in fact most of the trees that we had that came under the ages of birds or indeed subsequently with them um, with with animals like things like oak and 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 um, hazel they didn't actually come in the birds tummies because if you meet a hazel not that's the end of it you don't get trees growing out of squirrel poo but um, they were brought and stored as food and then some of them survived to, 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 to um, spread so we're looking at then five species of evergreen trees and some of these like the yew and the pine and the juniper are narrow leaf trees and then the holly and the arbutus are broad leaf trees, but they have their they have their leaves all the year round. And the rest of them then, the other lot, the other, I suppose, 23 different ones are deciduous trees, which lose their leaves in the winter time and get them back in the summer time. So there are, I know somebody who are very good accountant know that there's not actually 21 trees there or 23 trees there. And that's because we have two native species of oak, we have two native species of cherry, we have two native species of birch, we have four of willow. So they do add up to 28, but there's not that, there's that not that number of, and there's not, that's just the number of trees that there are. Now, so how do we know all this? Indeed, how do we? Um, there was an oral tradition initially. People didn't write things down because the Mesolithic people going around in their boat being hunter-gatherers, they weren't writing anything down and they were, here and spoke to each other and observed all these things and talk, told their children and their children told their children. There was no television or recorded things on, on, on the internet in those days. And then they were replaced then maybe 5,000 years ago by Neolithic people. They came along and they were the new, they were the first farmers. So they were the new stone age. Neolithic means new stone age. And they were spreading because of agriculture. The, the world was changing again. They were able to grow their own food. Populations were increasing and they were coming along as well. So they had, they had their oral, oral traditions as well. They were new people, different um, beliefs they had. So they had different ones. We move on from them then to the Bronze Age. And by the time we get to 2000 years ago, we're into the Iron Age and the Celt. So these were all talking to each other, passing down the stories, nothing written down, oral tradition. And we really only got written word from the second century AD. So that's like the year 200 was when things were written down in the first instance. And subsequently to that then, even though we have ancient books like the Book of Leinster and the Book of, well, not the Book of Celt so much, but some of these other annals and books written in the eighth and ninth century, which would be um, four or five hundred years after the written word down there at the bottom. These were writing down in those days what people had been telling the stories over the years. So the things the Mesolithic people told, the Neolithic people who told the Bronze Age people would have eventually ended up in the annals of Inish Fallon or some of these ancient books written maybe 1500 years ago. So that's how, how we know what was an originally an oral tradition and is now um, written down. Now, the first alphabet you'd be delighted to know was originally a tree alphabet. So it wasn't like the alphabet I'm looking at here, alpha, beta, the names we have with the Greek letters. So 20 letters were named after trees. Now, there were five vowels, like there still are. So the pine, the ash, the elm, the aspen and the yew, they were the trees that were the five vowels. And there were 15 consonants. And there's a list of the ones that were used for the consonants. So with those 20 letters, that was what the, the, the original tree alphabet was about. So um, again, we're looking at writing down the language people spoke. So there were different words in ancient Irish, different words and letters, but they came from that. And that's very interesting because that was what the people saw there. And all of those trees, if you look at them, they're all native. Now, I do know that they're kind of pushing it and saying that a, a broom is a tree, but it is a big woody plant. 
and um, with lovely yellow flowers on it. Like, and I see firs is included as well, which is not really a tree as such in the strict definition of a tree. But um, nonetheless, there were woody plants and they were included. And I'm not going to argue with people who are long dead that these are not trees. This is what their tree alphabet was and that was it. So interestingly, though, there was no arbutus in that alphabet. And arbutus is a big, big tree. You think if you were looking for a tree, wouldn't you use arbutus instead of broom? But no. And there was no elm. Now, I know um, elm became very scarce 5,000 years ago, but um, obviously it wasn't even common when they were doing these things. White beam, which is a lovely native tree, was considered to be a form of hazel, fionnquil, like the fair, the fair hazel. No spindle, no aspen, no juniper. These didn't, didn't actually make the cut to be part of the letters, even though they would have been known to the people there. So who, who decided what was going to be in and what was going to be out? But anyway, it didn't take long before we got from the, this tree alphabet into something more permanent. And what I'm talking about is Ohm. Ohm was the actual chiselled into stone letters that survives. We have it to this day on rocks, on stones. And it was a direct translation, if you like. It was the next step from the tree alphabet itself. And this dates from the second century AD. And it was actually used for 600 years until the eighth century. So there's several hundred of them around still, and they were written on stones, and we know what they say. We know that they said maybe who lived in the area, who was buried there, something about what was happening in the area at the time. And these these are all based on the on the tree alphabet itself. So a direct a direct translation or a direct movement, if you like, from from this this tree alphabet to the ohm. So this is the OM. You can have a look at that and you can write your own name in Owen if you like. So I'm talking there. There's the, the um, uh, E, I, O, U, there the vowels. And then we have three lots of consonants. And that's what I'm saying about uh, these letters here. So you had them straight across. You had them on one side. You had them on the other side. And then you had slanty ones. So there was only up to five. Of course, they couldn't be, couldn't be chiseling any more than five lines in any direction. So it was from one to five. And you read it from the bottom up. So that was A, O, U, E. I do a read from the bottom up. So when you're reading a gnome stone, you read it from the bottom up, not from the top down as we might do nowadays with a gravestone. You read them from the bottom up. So S, T and N, G were letters that we don't have now, but they were part of the language that they spoke. These were the letters that were used to, to, to convey what they meant by that. So here's an example now, for example, this is this is an ohm stone from Ardmore, which is down in Waterford, and this has now been moved out of wherever it was, and it's in the chancel of St. Declan's Cathedral in, in Ardmore itself. Bringing it indoors gives it more protection, and anyone can go down and look at it. Now, the line that I was showing you in the last one, if I can get back to it without losing everything, yeah, there's the line you can see that I'm writing it on a page, but these weren't written on pages. These were actually written on stones. So the line was the edge of the stone, the corner. So you had a square stone and you went round the two sides of the stone, giving you that same shape. So that was, you'd read that from the bottom up. So here's one to read now for you. What's that? That's one letter. That's another letter. That's another letter. And then those two are the same. And that's another letter there. That's the same as that one. So that's an E. A. N. N. A. Who's called Aina? Well, that's my name. And Owen. There you go now. You can do your own if you want. So that was one, one really important thing then about trees, how they, they actually contributed to being able to write, being able to convey all this information in stone that we still know to this day from, from practically 2000 years ago. It's amazing. Now, another thing that was really important about trees was they're important in place names. You can imagine coming here, whole place covered in trees. Well, you describe places by the trees you saw because that was what you could describe. Now, we tend to think that quill is the Irish word for a wood. There's the quill. And in places like Quilty and Clare, like Kylemore and Mayo, Quilmore, Kilty. But quill is actually a particular kind of wood. So a quill is a wood full of hazel trees. Call is the name for a hazel tree. So a collection of hazel trees is quill. So it's not the only word for woods, although the way we do things in school now, that's the only one that really has survived. I mean, if you go up to where the Inuit are in, 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 in the far north, they, they have lots of different words for snow. And we had lots of different words for woods in the olden days, very old days. Ross was a word for a woodland in the southern half of the country. So you had Ross Common. I know that's not the southern half. But what I mean is not Donegal. Donegal Ross means a peninsula. But southern south from that, it means a wood. So you have Ross Common. 
you know, St. Commons Wood, Ross Cray, Ross Carberry. There's lots of Rosses in the lower half of the country and they're all meaning the wood. Fee is another word. There's Feathered, which is Fee Yard, the high wood, Rats Fee. And Crave is a branch. So Cravey Creel, the narrow branch. Winya is a crowd of bushes. So you have Bolya Mun, Winya Big. These are all places called after that. And Billa. Billa is a great one. I'm going to tell you more about Billa in a minute. It, it looks like Bile there, but we're not speaking English. We're speaking Irish. So it's Billa. And that's Rathvilly, Moville. Billa is a particular kind of a very, very important tree. So if you had a place with Billy in it, it doesn't mean a villa like something in Italy. It goes way back to Billas. Now, other places then after the oak, we have, um, so the, I was telling you the first that lot, they were all about the names of woodlands and the names of genital trees. Then we have specific trees. So there's the oak. We all know about the oak. Dar, Derry, Kildare, there's 1600 town land names called after the oak tree. So you can see how, how important the oak was and how much of the landscape was covered in oak trees. Then we have yew, the yew tree, and the second most common place name is yew. And I mean, we, we don't tend to see so many yews anymore. So mayo was the plane of the yew, mwi yo, nuri was yorkintra, yol was yo, krill rush was ross yo, ross being a wood and yo being in the yew wood, terra where I live myself, tear on yew. Because yew was the tree that they used for making bows with, weapons of mass destruction before they invented gunpowder in the 1400s. So you'd have to keep a supply of you growing around your grounds in order to be able to have weapons for your for your soldiers, for your men. I mean, the Normans were the great were the great exponents of using of archery, of using bows. The Mayo men must have been mighty men. They had a whole plane full of views. We yo. Hawthorne then is on Shkak, so you have Clon Ski, Ski in the Rinky, anywhere you have Shkak and it or Ski. Birch is Bay, Glen Bay, Bally Bay, Willow is Sal, so Clon Sill is Sal. And so these are only an example. I mean, I have a whole a whole poster, the tree council has a whole poster of all the different places that are called after after trees. Blackthorn is Jalog, so we have done Dune Jalog, and where I was going to school, Dawkey, Delgany, they all refer to the Jalog part of the Blackthorn. Apple is Ool, so we've Owlert, Alder is Ferns, Elder, Elm, Hazel, Holly, Arbutus. See, Arbutus made the cut for the place name, so that's Katnia. So Ard Katnia is Smerik, and Quincha is Capricorn. So these trees were all over the country and people called places after them because they meant so much to them and they were so important. So an awful lot of places that you mightn't even think are called after after trees are Michael and Glencull and Trim and County Mead, Moss Trim, after the elder tree, for example. Now, people then were organised. You got into the Neolithic people, you were settled, you were Bronze Age, people owned land, people had rights, all of this kind of thing. So when people are living together in communities, we have to have laws to organise all of this. So the laws of people in Ireland were called the Brehan laws. They were only changed really at the end of the 15 to 1600s after the flight of the Earls and English um, rule under Queen Elizabeth came in. So the Brehan laws applied in Ireland from where people required laws right up to the end of the 1500s. So there was lots and lots of things governed in Brehan law. Women had more rights in Brehan law than they had afterwards in other laws, but we're talking about trees today. So the importance of trees in Brehan law was really important. So they had divided the trees up into how important they were. And they were, they, they, they had these, as I said, the, the Irish that I'm looking at here, like Arig Fedo and Ahi Fedo. These are ancient Irish, old Irish. We were living in modern Irish and then there was middle Irish and then there was old Irish. So these are old Irish. So there's they're quite a, we wouldn't kind of know what those words meant looking at modern Irish. But Arig Fedo meant the nobles of the wood. They were the important trees. They were the ones that we really, really depended on to be able to live. Then we had the Ahig Fedo. They were the commoners. They weren't too bad. They weren't as good as the nobles, but they were all right. And then, of course, you had the peasants, the fola fedo. So the fola were the lower divisions of the wood. And then you had the bushes of the wood, the loss of fedo. So there were four categories of trees and there were seven trees in each category. And there were different things about the different categories, depending on what was going on. So the nobles were the ones they really wanted. So you had oak, hazel, holly, yew, ash, pine and apple. These were important trees, useful for how people lived. Then we had the commoners, which were valuable enough, alder, willow, hawthorn, rowan, birch, elm and cherry. Lower divisions then were down to blackthorn, elder, spindle, white beam, arbutus, aspen and juniper. And then finally, the bushes are actually bushes. So we've gorse, 
or firs, broom, bog myrtle, bracken heathers, whatever. So they were they were the, the four groups of trees that they considered to be so very important. And you were in trouble if you did any harm to them. So if you cut down a commoner or you cut down a noble, you had to pay a fine of two and a half milk cows. I know you got a half cow, but anyway, I suppose if you cut down two trees, that was five. I'll tell you one thing, you wouldn't be chopping down the trees willy-nilly in those days if you had to be parting with your cows. You could take a take a leaf out of the book of some of the, of some of the Brehan law, and then the lower the lower divisions and the bushes, even for cutting down a firs bush, you could be charged a dart, which is a year old heifer. So they they really took the trees very seriously. They were really important for how people lived, and you took them away at your peril, belonging to somebody else. Now another aspect, then, just to change the subject again, we're looking at the folklore of trees because this is, I suppose, what was promised in the title, if you like. The, so the folklore of trees, how were they, how important were they to how people lived? You know, what did we think was going to happen from them? So there's there's, there's two aspects to this folklore. So the first is that particular tree itself. So this particular tree over here in this field. So it's not the species, it's that actual tree, this villa that I'll be coming back to. The role of a particular tree itself as a marker of an important place in the community. So that big particular tree in our parish, that's what I'm talking about there. Whereas the role of different species play as a source of magical power. That's just any old rowan tree will be like this or any old elder. So you have a big important tree and then you have a species. So we'll have a look at those. So the big important trees that I was telling you were the villas. These were sacred trees, sacred to the gods that we had way back before Christianity. And they were known by the title Billa. So each tribe, each tribe had a Billa as a symbol of their power. And of course, the enemy tribes then tried to destroy them. So if I'm coming to attack your tribe and you have this great big tree that your kings are crowned under or your chieftains are crowned under or your enemies are hanged on. Well, the first thing I want to do if I'm coming in to attack is to cut down your tree and then you won't have this source of, of power any longer. And then, of course, the bigger the the bigger the the, the, the the kingdoms, the bigger the the more important the villas. And there were five. There were five great villas in ancient Ireland. So there were there were five of these. So you can see, you know, I mean, these are the names of them. You can look at that again. An ash. This was the first one was an ash. Second one was an ash. The third one was an ash. So the importance of ash in those days. And then you had an oak in County Kildare. And then you actually had a yew tree in in County Carlow. So this idea of villas actually survived, survived right up to Christianity in actual fact. And um, they were the power, they were the power of the chieftains, they were the power of the pagan tribes, they were the power of of, of a community that lived there and the, the, their power was was manifested in this wonderful tree where they, they had their, their great sessions and it was a symbol of their power. But then when the early Christians came, St. Patrick and the lads, they were actually looking at these as pagan emblems because they were bringing Christianity. They had they had a different God. They didn't have gods as trees or any of this sort of thing. Therefore, they thought these are pagan emblems and we will get rid of them. So they, they, the monks actually went around destroying them. This Yo Rasa that I was saying, this is the yew tree down there in County Carlo. This was destroyed by St. Lazarian and his monks. There's accounts of them all holding hands and dancing around in circles, saying prayers for the tree to fall down, which it did. So you can imagine. So I wonder, did they get fined a whole heap of cows? So then they probably just prayed it and the tree died because the, the, the Christianity was was um, conquering paganism. This was what went into the folklore. And this is what I'm telling you. Now, the next thing then was um, wells. So wells were connected to the underworld and lots of trees were at wells. Now, wells were watered and bubbled up from underground springs. There's nothing magical about those. We have we have wells to this day. People have wells all over the world coming up from the groundwater. But I mean, we didn't know about groundwater and underwater rocks for though, for though. So the, the tree, the, the wells were connections to the underworld. So you had a well, there was water. And then if you jumped in, you could get into the underworld. That was thought at any rate, which was a whole different kingdom. So the wells where the trees were, these were, these were even more important. So how how were you going to get rid of this? I mean, the trees, the, the, the early Christians could actually um, curse the trees, or cut them down if they had to, but they couldn't destroy the wells, really. I mean, they, these came up from the ground, they couldn't be got rid of. So they, they converted the wells. So they converted them to holy wells. And then we've loads of holy wells all around the country to this very day. And trees growing at the holy wells in Severn still are adorned with rags, are adorned with with symbols and emblems because it's a holy well and the holy well may very well have a cure for something. 
And so because they're all converted, you have Patrick's well, you have Bridget's well, you have Mary well, and you've seen something's well, and there's curry for your eyes, there's cure for this. But these have only converted wells. These were wells that were pagan symbols, and we're only putting a veneer on it, as it were. Here's another one down somewhere else. And we're looking at this one really adorned with trees all over the place. And I see St. Patrick is to the good in the middle of that. That's down in Kilkenny, I think. In fact, Aubrey Fennell, who has written, he's, he's written this book called The Heritage Trees of Ireland, which is one of the books you can get from the Tree Council of Ireland. And he has a whole section in this book on the Holy Wells of Ireland and the trees that are there and the importance of the trees and what they, they symbolise. And um, it's, it's interesting to have a look at that. So all of these wells then were, were, were of great importance. And as I said, they've been converted to holy wells, but they're still there. They're still the emblems of paganism from 2000 years ago. Amazing. And then, of course, I was saying, you know, they're the actual particular tree. So a particular tree is a holy well. Lost them might have been Hawthorne, particular tree. But in this case, now we're talking about species, roles that different species play as a source of, of magical power. So these are different ones again. So now we're looking at trees, different species of trees. So we had we had 20 trees to be the alphabet and that turned into one. Now, looking at it from a different point of view, we're looking at 13 of these trees that were the symbols of the Celtic calendar. Now we have the Gregorian calendar brought in by um, Pope Gregory way back in, oh, I don't know, the 1500s or something like that. And um, we have 12 months of the year and the names on our months like March and January and February, they refer to Roman gods, marches from Mars, the, the, the god of war, for example. And then they, they ran out of things to say. So they have September, October, November, December, means September, Sept is seven. So the seventh month, the eighth month, the ninth month, the tenth month, the eleventh month is January, the twelfth month. And then March was the beginning of the year in the, in the, in the Gregorian calendar. But we had our calendar long before that. And we had a Celtic calendar and there were 13 13 um, months in the, in the Celtic calendar and there were 13 trees that symbolised that because there's lunar months, you see. Uh, the, the lunar month is 28 days. If you look at the moon, it rises at a different date every month. It's, so the, the lunar months are different to the calendar months from the Gregorian calendar. So if you divide them up properly, there's, there's 13, 13 by 4, that's 52 weeks in the year. So it began and the, the, the Celts began in the winter time. They began at Samhain which was the beginning of winter. That was as far as they were concerned. This was the first of the year, month of the year. Now, what are you going to have for your trees if you're starting off in November? Well, you want something with leaves on it, obviously. So here's the yew tree. The yew is the symbol for, for, for that particular month. And you, this is a picture of a female yew tree here with the berries on it. And this is the, the native yew woodlands that we have down in Killarney in County Kerry. And these are the original yew trees that look that they made the bows from, that they had them there. And um, used yew trees are poisonous. The leaves of them are poisonous. And so once, once um, we had invented gunpowder and didn't need so many yew trees, Farmers didn't want them in their land, obviously, because the animals might eat them. So we don't have them so commonly nowadays. And as a result, you know, what we think is a yew tree is in actual fact something like this. Now, this is what you see nowadays, and this is a particular mutant, if you like. This is a tree called the Irish yew. It just happened by chance in County Fermanagh in the 1700s up in Florence Court. The yew grew in this shape with all its branches up in the air. And of course, you could clip it and clip it and clip it. You could make lovely shapes out of it. And Lord Florence Court made a fortune selling this tree as um, for places like Versailles, all over Europe for topiary. And it could only grow from clippings. This was a female tree. Yew trees are male and female, two different trees. This one is a female tree. But if you take a berry off it and plant it, it grow back to one of the ones that you have below in Killarney, the proper shape of a tree with a stem up the middle and the branches on the top. So people tend to think that that's what a yew tree looks like. That's what a particular type of yew tree looks like. The other yew trees with the straight with the straight stem and the branches on the top were the original yew tree. So <clears throat> this is the letter I is comes after the yew tree on your I. So first to the 28th of November, it was the symbol of death. It was the symbol of eternity. And of course, it was a noble of the wood because of the excellence of the timber. Special kind of timber, it grows on differently on 
on two sides. So you can make a bow from it. You can bend it. You try to make a bow from, oh, I don't know, a lump of an ash tree or a lump of a, a lump of um, an oak tree and you pull the bow, it'll bend and break. That's why when they make the hurlies, they have to get the boss the way the branch grows into the ground, the way the, the way the thing happens naturally in the tree in order to get the hurley. You can't just carve a thing out and have an excellent hurley from it. So the, the, the yew tree had had um, an importance because you could make the bows from it. And that was that one. Now we're moving on to the next one and we're into the next month and we're talking again about an evergreen tree. We're talking now about the Scots pine. And people say, oh, that's the Scots pine, that's Scotland. No, Scotia was an old name for Ireland. It wasn't a name for Scotland. Originally, it was a name for Ireland and the Scots pine was the tree that grew in Ireland. So this was the, called the goose. It was the letter A. Now, don't ask me how you get A from G because we're not talking about the same Irish as we were when we wrote this language of when we had this these letters way back in those times. So next month there's November to December. So this is the tree of Christmas nearly in a sense. So you have the shortest day on the 22nd and then coming back. So this is a symbol of renewal, rebirth. Pine burns very well. They grew so they burn well and they give bright light and they're renewal. So they grew out of the graves of Diarmid and Nisha. Diarmid and Nisha. Nisha was one of the children of Ushnok and he ran away with Derdra who was beautiful woman at the time and Finn McCool fancied her and ran after them and everything else and they all died and um, it was all very sad anyway out of their graves because they were so much in love did come a ute, a pine tree came out of that and again it was a noble of the wood because pine resin collected from that was used to cork boats and boats were very important then because there were no roads as such the only way you had to get around was in the rivers so you didn't want holes in your boats so now we're moving on to springtime and we're talking about something brighter. We're talking about the birch tree. And look at those. I mean, there's no leaves on them yet. I mean, we're looking at these now in January. But that 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 bark, that light is 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 something that you're looking forward to. The days are getting longer now, you see. This is a, 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 a woodland of birch in County Westmead with a whole lower case of, of lovely bluebells in it later on in the year. So birch set a bee on there. That was Jan December to the 23rd of January, symbol of childbirth, the symbol of love. It protected babies in the cradle. So if you made a cradle out of birch, your baby was grand, strewed the bed of lovers, commoner in the woods. So it wasn't quite as important as the nobles, but they made broom, they made dye from it. And you still have to own up and sell two and a half of your cows if you could cut down one of them. So they were important. Now we're on to the next one now, and this is a picture of it in the autumn time with berries. We're looking at the rowan tree, the mountain ash. So the mountain ash in the, is the next month of the year and it was the clearing. So it's the 24th of January to the 20th of February. Now, the mountain ash at this time of the year won't have berries or flowers or leaves on it as yet, but it's going to be doing all of this. This was known to be the case. Now, the roan is a symbol of protection against evil and against fire. And even even if you if you read Harry Potter and and, and the the the, the um, the ones that the various wizards had in it. The good guy, Harry Potter, has has Rowan in his bow or in his in his um wand because it's the tree of protection against evil and fire. It keeps away witches. If you have a rowan tree outside your house, you certainly won't have witches. If you plant it on the on a grave, it'll stop the dead from rising. And that really works. It protects cattle, it protects milk. And through the year then, the the, the um Cattle were driven through Rowan fire on May Eve. They, they quite often did that with cattle, sort of rushed them through a bonfire. And in fact, the real reason was because they kind of, the, they, they, were, they went quickly through it, you might imagine. But the flames would burn off, lick, you know, ticks and lice and things that might be in the cattle. But um, if you made your fire from Rowan, then it protected them from all kinds of witches and evil as well. And again, it was a commoner of the wood. They ate the berries. They made a drink from them as well, too. And you can still eat the berries. Some of them they're quite bitter now. I have to say, you need a lot of sugar to make elder to make the the the, um, the rowan jam. But it's it's something you might have as a savoury, really. Now we're on to the next one. We're on to the alder, and this is the alder with the lovely heart shaped leaves. And this is a great tree altogether. Quite big tree, dark. Look at that there. Now, good tall tree. Lovely, lovely. Um, Dark, dark timber on it. It's 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 on Farnog, lots of it in Cavan and places like that. And the letter F comes from that. It's the months from February to March. So it's around at the beginning of three week. This would have been an alder. We started three, three week this year on the 20th of March. So we were just coming out of the alder month. Now, it, this one is associated with war and with death. So there were huge Bronze Age shields made from alder. Alder is a really strong wood. It's resistant to getting wet. 
And when you, you know, when you cut the timber, it goes a very orangey colour. So we had the Red Branch Knights, who were the, 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 um, the army of Conor MacNessa, the fellow who was the uncle of Cú Cullen. And the Red Branch Knights then, Cú Cullen became a member of them subsequently, they, they had big red shields, obviously, made from alder in actual fact. Now, alder was an unlucky tree, so it's best to avoid it if you're going on a journey. Now, mind you, the alder grows in the marsh, so if you were going on a journey, it is a good idea not to be walking in the marsh, so it makes more sense. So, um, you know, the, the alder tree growing would indicate that from a distance, this is in a marshy place, so we won't walk past there, we might get stuck. So, um, you know, it was made sense, really. And again, it was a commoner of the wood, so they made the shields from them, bowls, charcoal, black dye, all of this kind of thing was made from the alder. Now, willow then is the next one, and we have four native species of willow, so we're not really talking about which willow. There's the grey willow, there's the goat willow, there's another willow, like all of these willows. Uh, we know they're willows because they have these lovely catkins on them and their seeds are very small. So the willow is on sal or salioc, salis, all these words, and the letter S is associated with that. So we're into March, April. So we're actually, as we speak this instant, we are in the month of the willow on sal. And it was associated with life, with fertility for humans. And we know at this time of the year, beginning to get newborn, new things beginning to be born, fertility, life, all of this is happening. Now, they made they made the Irish harp from it. And I'm sure you all know the story of Larry Lynchy. Larry Lynchy was the terrible king who had horses' ears and he didn't want anyone to know. And he grew his hair real long so nobody would see them. And of course, he had to get his hair cut every year. And the barber, when he cut his hair, saw the horse's ears. And of course, this was a terrible because kings in those days had to be perfect. They couldn't have a king with something wrong with them. So as a result, um, every time Larry Lynchy got his hair cut, he beheaded the barber afterwards. He was a really nice man, Larry Lynchy. So I can imagine there was no queue of people wanting to be cutting his hair. So he used to commandeer people. So he commandeered some poor unfortunate who was the only son of a widow. And the widow was having no, none of this nonsense. So she marched up to Larry Lynch and she said she'd put the widow's curse on him, which was a curse beyond all measure if he, she, if he went near his son. So Larry Lynch, she said, OK, cut me hair if he never reveals to his soul what he sees. So your man cut the hair, saw the ears, and he had this terrible secret. What would you do with a secret like that? So he went out and he put his arms around the nearest tree and he whispered into the tree, Larry Lynch, she has horse's ears. It was a willow tree. And wouldn't you know, the, 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 the harper in the, in, the, in the palace of Lowry Link, she was wanting a new harp and the Irish harp. In fact, the Irish harp to this day has, has willow in it. Put down the willow tree, made the harp. Oh, it was, took ages to make the harp. It must have taken six months because there's other timbers in it as well. And there was a great occasion of the launch of the new harp. Everybody was assembled. Lowry Link, she was up at the top looking fierce and parted and his hair gorgeous. And when they played the harp, the only sound came out of the harp was a voice that said, Larry Link, she has horse's ears. Larry Link, she has horse's ears. His secret was revealed and he was caught. So the moral of the story is, do not tell your secret to a willow tree if you don't want anyone to know. And again, it was a commoner of the wood. All of these things, baskets, wicker work, a lot of bending, you can make baskets, it's really useful. And aspirin, that drug that we take in order nowadays for pain care, comes from the bark of the, of the willow salicylic acid, it's the name of it in Latin. Now we're moving on, it's getting warmer in the year and we're into the, the hawthorn or the white thorn. It's called a hawthorn because the haws are on it. It's called a white thorn because the flowers are white. So there's your haws that come out in the, in the autumn time and we have the flowers on it, obviously, in springtime. Now, this, this is the hawth, this is the one down in County Clare, and when they were building the motorway, they couldn't cut down this hawthorn because it was a very famous one. Why? Because it's the symbol of the fairies. This is the thing about the hawthorn, it's the symbol of the fairies and of magical powers, particularly lone bushes. So not a whole hedge of them, but a lone bush. Now, hawthorn is Shkakyal, it's the letter H, it goes the 18th of April to the 15th of May. And the fairies weren't good people. I mean, I know nowadays, People have little doors on trees and fairies are little dainty creatures going around and being nice. But the ancient she, the ancient fairies of Ireland were actually considered to be the two they Danann. And they were the people that lived in Ireland before the next lot of, of Celts arrived and defeated them in battle and they had to live underground. And they were given to not like and living underground or coming out and attacking people when they didn't like them. So you had to be nice to the little people. You had to be nice to the fairies, otherwise you'd be in trouble. And the fairies really loved the hawthorn and these two with the and that lived under the ground and they'd come out and they'd dance around the tree. So if you were to go near it, death and harm would come to you. 
So, you know, you didn't go near the Hawthorne. And that that road down player that I showed you was only built maybe 20 to 30 years ago around Ennis. And they did not take out that tree because they didn't want to throw the ire of the, the, the fairies of Munster. Now, the fellow in charge couldn't believe this. And he went to get his chainsaw to cut it down because the men on the road wouldn't do it for him. And he crashed his car on the way home. Now, he wasn't killed, but, he, you know, the fairies were getting him. So the thing is still there. Now, Hawthorne, Hawthorne flowers smell of death. And it was unlucky to bring a hawthorn into the house. So if you bring hawthorn flowers into the house, it builds up with this musky smell, which is supposed to remind people of dead bodies. And um, it's unlucky, so you don't bring it in. Now, out of the 210 holy wells in Ireland, 103 of them have a hawthorn associated with them. It was the billa. It was the important tree for the Maguire chiefs of this and ski. So a lot of importance about the hawthorn. And, of course, it was a commoner of the wood. And they own, but the berries aren't very sweet, they're kind of dry old things. So it was eaten when food was scarce. And there's an expression, when all fruit fails, welcome haw. Oh, you'd only eat it if you were desperately stuck, if you were a human. Now the birds love it and they eat it. And lots of our hawthorn trees are actually planted from bird droppings. We're moving on. Now we're at the ash tree. There's another picture of an ash up in County Dublin. And you can see the long leaves the ash has. Now ash is a very common native tree that has been suffering from a disease lately called ash dieback so that's very worrying but the ash was a really important tree long ago there's the one i was showing you from clonmel the tallest one again and it's the letter o that goes with the ash one of the consonants so it's may to june symbol of healing now it's considered to attract lightning so if you burnt an ash tree in your house that would banish the devil because you know it would take away the, the, the flames of hell now, <laughs> an ash plant is a friendly stick to beat cattle with now, what do you mean by a friendly stick? Well, if you could, if you took an unfriendly tree like the elder and hit something with it, that would bring a curse on whatever you hit. But the ash plants, you just say, I get along there. People used to you know, give them a wallop on their backs to make them hurry up a bit more. Now, they didn't hurt their cattle. They were just hooshing them along. Well, an ash plant was what you'd use. You wouldn't just use any old stick. And again, at the Holy Wells, 75 of the of these trees are second only to the, to the, to the hawthorn. Now, Queen Maeve, she was a around at the same time as Coo and she had a horse whip of ash. So, I mean, she was always getting new horse whips and cutting lumps off the trees. And so Bill and Maeve everywhere. So like every time she put down her horse whip, it grew into a tree or so the story said. Because the three of the great billets, as I showed you way back, were, were, were ash. And the, the greatest one then was Bill of Thorhoon and Mead. So there were three of those. Now, the ash is the last tree to get its leaves. The oak is the second last, but we have this expression, the oak before the ash, we'll have a dash of rain, and the ash before the oak, we'll have a soak. We don't ever want to think we're going to have a wet summer, and the ash is always the last, really. So we can always say every year, oh, the oak is out first, we're going to have a good summer, and that cheers people up, which is important. Now, this was a noble of the wood. This is really important. In Cook Holland, when he was Satanta, before he got his new name, he was a great man for playing Hurley. Made, you made spears out of it, you made thrones out of it, you made boats out of it. It was really, really important and you were in mighty trouble if you cut down an ash. And then, of course, we have to have the oak. The oak has to get its importance as well. Here's a nice oak in County Meath and this is what the, the leaves look like there. Here's a wonderful oak tree that's down in County Offaly where the mighty oaks, I mean, there's a man standing beside the branch there. You can see how enormously huge this oak tree is in the wintertime without its leaves. And there it is, a close up of the same oak tree. Huge. They can grow to be huge and very old. And of course, this was the king of the woods. It was symbolised kingship, endurance and strength. And it's the letter D on Dar from that. Now, it was the tree of the Druids. The Druids were the, were the chiefs, if you like, before St. Patrick and before Christianity. They were very important um, people who, who um, administered a lot of the old religion and the old rules and things like that. So this was the tree that they had. And it was Christianized then, of course, we put Christianized Christians on everything. So Dura, Dura Column Kill, that's what Derry is in Doro. Column Kill had a monastery there as well. They had Kill Dara, which is the church of the Oak Trees that St. Bridget had. So it was it was converted too. But anyway, it was Willem, Billamunia. This is the one in the moon in County Carlo, and that was an oak. But it was because it was a bill, it was magic. It had acorns, it had apples, and it had nuts all at the same time. Now, acorns are nuts. I don't know what kind of nuts it had. Hazelnuts, maybe. Who knows? I mean, obviously, it was a magic tree. Now, it didn't even need St. Lazarian. So a poet wrote a satire. Now, a satire was a nasty poem. It was a poem that said, you know, nasty things about people. And this poet had written a satire about the tree and saying nasty things about the tree and stood up and 
recited the satire because he was obviously an enemy. He was again the other lot and he wanted to kill their tree. So he wrote a satire, recited the satire at the tree, and the tree was so offended that it died. Yeah, I'm not telling you a lie. That's what that's what the, the, the folklore tells us. Again, noble, noble of the wood, used for shipbuilding, used for barrels, used for tanning. Animals could eat the acorns, really important tree. Now we're nearly getting there because there's only 13 months in the year. This is the holly, the prickly one. And again, they can grow quite large. There's a holly now, one of the biggest hollies in Ireland, and it's an enormous tree there, you can see. And this was the letter T that came with the quillen. So that's July to August, similar protection, the ability of champions. That's what it was. If you had a holly tree, you were protected. So it was the one you used where you made, you had the alder for your shield, but you made your weapons out of the holly. So you could have darts, you could have arrows, you could have spears made from the holly. And of course, it's associated with the god Lou. Because you see, the thing about holly is, holly is evergreen. So in the winter time, when everything has no leaves on it and the sun is going down and down and down and down and that by the solstice, by the 21st of December, it's at its lowest point. Is it ever going to come back? And then the 23rd of December, the 24th, the 25th, it's coming back up. So it's going to come back. It's going to the, the sun. The sun hasn't gone away forever. And we were so glad that the sun was coming back. People went out and brought in whatever they could see growing in the woods and what was growing in the woods with leaves on it in the middle of December were holly. So even though people bring in holly today for Christmas, it's actually a custom that goes back 5,000 years to associate the god Lou. Lou was coming, the sun was coming back, things were still alive in the woodlands and you brought something in to honour the god of Lou. And again, it was a noble of the wood, so chariot poles, spears, shoots were eaten for fodder and clean and things and things like that. So it was a very important tree. And now we're looking at the hazel tree. And the hazel tree has lovely catkins this time of the year. They're the male catkins, they're the female catkins, they're the male ones, they're the female ones, and the leaves then are lovely and soft. And then of course in the autumn time in, in August, really August, September, we are going to get the hazelnuts on it. So the hazelnut tree of wisdom. So it's from August to September. And um, hazel rods were used to divine water. So you see, sometimes I remember as a child seeing people with a forked hazel in their hands walking around and in whatever way, if they walked over the spring, the hazel rod would actually jump in their hands. It was some um, ability people had to do this. Not everybody could. And the story tells us that the, the well of Sagish, or sometimes people call it the well of Condla, was the source of all the rivers of Ireland. It was surrounded by nine hazel trees. The hazel trees had nuts, they fell into the rivers. The fish at the rivers there and they knew everything. So this is where your salmon of knowledge in the Boyne came from. So they ate the nuts of the tree of wisdom. So again, it was a noble of the wood. The nuts were important as food. The, 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 the branches of the hazel tree, if you cut down a hazel, it would grow again and again. You could coppice it. So you have hazel trees very old who get cut for their rods every 50 or 60 years. And you get, well, maybe even quicker than that to make wicker, to make baskets. Wattle was what you made walls out of, of clay and wattle made. Wasn't that what? And WB8 was going to build on the Lake Isle of Inishfree. And Wattle was a weaving, if you like, of, of, of hazel and then mud on top of that. So these were these were all important things. Scullins were little V's from the branches where they met another branch. And um, they used it to hold down the roof, to hold down the thatching. And of course, we have the expression, Nihe la on the Rija, la on the Scullaba. So the day the big wind wasn't the day to be fixing your thatch and looking at your scallops. You should have done that long before then. So we, we should be prepared for eventualities. Apple. This is the crab apple now. This is not the lovely sweet apples that we have nowadays, but these were a different, if you like, variety. This was the crab apple, and the crab apple were very important. They're the flowers, and the flowers are lovely, and they're a source of nectar for bees, which made honey from them. And we're into the Yule, the letter Q, September to October. And this was the delight of the afterworld. So if you went down the well into the afterworld, this was a symbol of the delights that would happen to you there. Manon and Maclear, he lived on the, Manon and Maclear probably lived on the Isle of Man. He was to see God and he lived on an island full of apple trees. It was a land of promise, a land of happiness. And of course, we know about the Halloween games, Bob and apples, looking for apples, peeling apples in one peel and throwing it over your shoulder and it'll be the symbol of, or it'll give a letter that's who's supposed to be the person that will make you happy in life. And again, a noble of the wood because the apples were for food, the apples were for cider. You made a, the bark made a yellow dye. It was an important tree, and there's plenty of um, crab apples around still, and they're, they're they're native and really important as a tree. And we're into the elder. We're back round to the end of the year again, and this is the elder tree that I was mentioning earlier. There's the flowers, there's the berries, and we're looking at that too. 
from the third to the 30th of October, that's the last tree. And this is the symbol of evil. This is the symbol of witchcraft. If you take a, a, the, a, the leaves of, a, of, a, of a, an elder tree and rub them in your fingers, it gives an awful smell. There's a dark berry on it. It's hostile to children. So if you put a baby in a cradle made out of elder, they tell us the baby will die. You should be making your cradles out of birch, if you remember. Now, this is only a sag. Of course, the baby won't die. But, you know, this is what they believed. If you hit somebody with, an, with, a, with a piece of an elder, they won't grow any bigger. So, you know, you wouldn't want to be hitting the cows with an elder by mistake. And the reason why it's all like this, apparently, is it's supposed to be in the, the, the tree that Christ was crucified, that the, the true cross was made from elder. Other people say it was the tree that Judas hanged himself on and that God cursed the tree because of these terrible things that were the tree was used for in Christian times. Now, again, this is not true, but obviously God doesn't go around cursing trees at all. But the tree does have this unpleasant smell. It does have these things associated with it. And it's a lower division of the wood because the timber is useless. It's really soft. But, but the flowers and the berries, obviously, when it was being cursed, the, cur the curse didn't apply to the flowers. They make lovely wine. They make lovely the berries. The same, they're food for birds. You can make red wine from the berries, make champagne from the flowers in actual fact. And, of course, Voldemort in Harry Potter, his web, his um, wand is has elder in it, in fact. So it's the baddie one. So that's the end of the year. We're back round to the end. And um, that's the, 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 the 13 trees of the calendar. Then we have cherry yellow aspen. These are all lower orders there of the native trees. I was telling you that before. Now, a lot of the information that I got, because, you know, I didn't wake up one day knowing everything, is um, from Niall McCotcher's book, who has written a wonderful book on Irish trees, myths, legends and folklore. And, you know, it's a whole book. I've only been speaking to you for the course of an hour. Whereas, I mean, if you were to look at this book, it's enough meat for a whole conference. So I recommend you to get that book if you like as well. So thank you all for your attention and I'm going to stop sharing now if I can manage this and um, okay. That's all right now, isn't it? Yeah, there we are. So I shall be back again now to you all. So thank you all very much for your rapt attention. Is there anyone left? Oh yeah, there's people still left listening to me. Good.